Rich is speaking for us today. Elise is a postdoctoral fellow at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health, so just across the way here. Um, and she's doing some really interesting work that I think we'll be excited about. Uh, it's interesting, we we're talking about, uh, I was just reading through the Eureka Alerts, which is all the new research coming out. And today, there's a big release on a systematic review talking about sexuality and particularly sexual abuse, resident to resident abuse, as well as, uh, as worker to resident abuse on sexuality. So it's, it's a, an up and coming area that tends to be understudied, so it's exciting that you're doing that. Um, and as you'll hear from the presentation, now this is bringing all kinds of interesting things. She's got a perspective with critical theories, feminist political economy, queer, uh, queer theories. She does qualitative and mixed method research. Um, and some of this works is funded by the Ontario Women's Health Scholars Award, as well as the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. So um, with no further ado, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, that was a great introduction. So I just want to start off by saying, um, talking a little bit about what I do. So I'm a political economist and a health services research, and all of my research focuses on sexuality, gender, aging, and long-term care. My research is motivated by my commitment to improve the quality of long-term care so that it better meets the needs of older adults, but also their families and care providers. And in my research, I explore gender and sexuality as social determinants of health and their influence on individuals' health needs and status and use of services. So currently in my postdoctoral research, I'm exploring how sexual expression is managed in the context of residential long-term care. And I'm focusing on providers' experiences with unwanted sexual attention from residents. Um, and this is the research that's supported by an Ontario Women's Health Scholars Award, and that award is funded by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. So my intention today is to share with you some examples from my research, including some emerging trends from the analysis that I've conducted thus far from my postdoctoral work, and also discuss some challenges that I've had in implementing and designing this research. So here's a brief overview of what I'll cover today, just to give you an idea. So my interest in exploring how sexuality and gender influence aging and long-term care began with my graduate work which focused on home care and older lesbian and bisexual women. At the public policy level in Canada, publicly paid for home care is considered to be only an add-on option to the unpaid care that family members, and in particular women, are expected to provide. Such familial social assistance policies are problematic for all women, but they may be especially so for women who are lesbian or bisexual. Um, and in particular, they're problematic because these women have lower levels of natal support, they're less likely to have children, and they also are at higher risk for poor mental health and poor physical health at younger ages than other older adults. Despite this, sexuality is not recognized as a health determinant, and while health and social care policies are written in ostensibly sexuality and gender neutral terms, their application in practice may support and reinforce sexual and gender-based health inequities. So in my thesis research, I found that older lesbian and bisexual women have restricted access to home care, and they have limited private resources to supplement publicly funded care. I also found that home care providers were at best ignorant of sexual diversity, and by implication that the person that they were caring for was not heterosexual, and assumed that they were heterosexual until they found out otherwise. And when providers did find out, they could become dismissive or discriminatory towards them. And this made receiving home care both isolating and stressful for older lesbian and bisexual women, because they felt that they had to be constantly on guard. When I asked them what could improve the quality of the care, they emphasized the importance of relational and interpersonal competencies of providers and their desire that providers acknowledge and affirm their sexual identities and actively strove to reduce their fears of being mistreated. And this research really demonstrates the value of considering how care relationships and interactions between care providers and care receivers are influenced by sexual and gender norms that are created and reinforced by public health and social care policies. Um, so this prompted me 
to do more postdoctoral work and to explore other assumptions around sexuality with the hope of also understanding providers' everyday experiences and practices in relation to that. And to that end, I decided to shift my focus to dementia and sexuality in residential long-term care. So this topic has received significant recent public and professional attention, and it offers a theoretically complex context within which to explore relational sexual dynamics. And I began by first exploring public assumptions about sexualities of persons living with dementia, focusing how these are represented in news media sources. So here in this slide are just a few examples of the headlines of news stories that I looked at. I found that discussions of sexuality and dementia primarily appear in the crime sections of news sources. And these are typically stories of sexual harassment or violence committed by or against persons with dementia. So in these stories, the sexual expressions of men with dementia are often dismissed as behavioral manifestations or they're pathologized as sexual crimes. Women with dementia, on the other hand, are typically represented as sexual victims or as essentially vulnerable to abuse from care providers, family members, and other residents. So this analysis provided important context for understanding how and why the sexuality of persons living with dementia is represented in the way that it is across scientific and professional literature. So, oops, there. Um, so working with my supervisor, Dr. Pia Contos, we found that as with media representations, the sexuality of persons with dementia are often considered to be troubling to both informal and formal care providers and thus restricted. In part, this is because the dominant ethical framework that underpins current long-term care policies and guidelines with regards to sexual expression is that of biomedical ethics. However, the application of this approach in the context of dementia and long-term care may be inappropriate because it disregards the performative, embodied, and relational aspects of ethical reasoning and the importance of sexuality for self-expression. So this led us to develop an alternative ethic of sexuality, an embodied and relational one, that we feel can better support facilitation of sexual expression. We realized that the development of policies, guidelines, and educational initiatives for long-term care based on this ethic is a complex undertaking. Not only is there the need to balance residents' right to sexual expression with their protection from undue risk, but we must also consider the rights of health practitioner for whom facilitations of resident sexual expression may constitute a moral compromise or compromise of their own sexual rights. And in particular, we need to better understand providers' experiences with sexual expression of residents and how and why they perceive these sexual expressions as both troubling or burdensome. So one type of sexual expression that has received a lot of recent attention in a context of public health is sexual harassment in the workplace. As an example, there's the recent Ontario Action Plan to Stop Sexual Violence and Harassment. And you may have also seen ads for the Ontario Nurses Association public health campaign called Code White that tackles violence by patients and others in hospitals against nurses. Um, so sexual harassment towards providers is sometimes also referred to as unwanted sexual attention in the literature. And this can range from residents making verbal sexual comments at providers, so for example, requests for sex, to their physical contact and non-contact behaviors towards providers, so for example, sexually gesturing towards a provider, touching of their breasts or buttocks, things like that. And there's research that suggests that these experiences are pervasive or everyday occurrences in residential long-term care. And they're also considered to be hazardous to the health and well-being of care providers. They can prompt feelings of stress, guilt, and shame that negatively affect their mood and overall mental health. They've been linked with providers' job dissatisfaction, burnout, and long-term sickness absence and have also been linked with increased rates of staff turnover. It's also hypothesized that these kinds of experiences can undermine the quality of the care 
by influencing the care relationship between care providers and care receivers. So for example, unwanted sexual attention has been shown to lead to avoidance and depersonalization towards care receivers. So the development of interventions to address this phenomenon is hampered by insufficient and limited knowledge. Most studies to date have been quantitative and have focused on describing and counting the number of times care receivers behave in sexually inappropriate manner and identifying potential antecedents or triggers of such behaviors. This research found that it's primarily male residents that have dementia who make sexual advances towards female care providers and that often such incidences are situational, which is to say that they occur during care activities that are personal in nature and require close physical proximity. So for example, bathing, dressing, feeding, toileting, things like that. There's multiple problems with how an appropriate sexual behavior is measured in these studies. So for example, quantitative measures of, sec of inappropriate sexual behavior are expansive and there's a lack of a consistent definition of what makes a sexual behavior inappropriate. So cited examples of what this could be in the literature have included everything from hand-holding to physical assault, the use of pornography, masturbation, sexual interest in someone other than their spouse, or even a change in sexual preference. So you can see how, how many different kinds of sexual behaviors are lumped together in these studies. Studies often also do not differentiate between residents' sexual attention towards providers and their sexual attention towards other individuals. Or they lump providers' exposure to unwanted sexual attention with their exposure to other forms of difficult conduct. So for example, verbal and physical rejection of care. And just to give you an example, one study used an instrument to measure these behaviors that have included everything from a resident spitting on the worker or not opening their mouth while they're being fed to sexual commentary. So you can see how expansive these instruments are and why it's problematic to base interventions or guidelines on this kind of research. So while this research did provide us with some information about unwanted sexual attention and long-term care and some of the circumstances around how it happens, it decontextualizes both workers and residents' experiences. And exploring this phenomenon only at the micro level of care is problematic because it assumes that this is an objective and universal phenomenon. So it assumes that there's clear and fixed boundaries between wanted and unwanted sexual attention or between sexual and non-sexual conduct and it also assumes that all workers will interpret sexual behavior of residents in the same manner and that all forms of sexual attention are equally and similarly threatening to workers' sense of self or their physical and mental integrity. It also ignores how the broader structural context and the organization of care in residential long-term care influences providers' experiences with sexual attention. There is, however, lots of evidence from research in other settings on sexual harassment and sexual expression that suggests that context is key for understanding sexual harassment or sexual attention, as definitions are both temporally and culturally constructed and are often subjective and contradictory. So to address these limitations and gaps in existing knowledge, in my postdoctoral research, I'm conducting a critical and multi-method study of unwanted sexual attention towards female care providers in one residential long-term care home in Ontario. I've chosen to do a single case study ethnography with multiple embedded units so that I can explore in depth how organizational norms and practices, including workplace culture, influence providers' experiences with this phenomenon. In particular, I want to understand how the residential long-term care organization as a meso-level structure mediates between macro-level structural interventions that address sexual harassment or unwanted sexual attention and individual provider decision-making and experiences at the micro-level of care. So to accomplish this, I'm collecting three types of data, public policy and organizational documents from the long-term care home, observations of providers' interactions with residents and of team meetings, 
and I'm also doing in-depth interviews with providers from diverse professions and with different roles, so both administrators and frontline clinical workers. <coughs> My research into this phenomenon is informed by a feminist political economy perspective. So this is a materialist or Marxist theory that considers all social relations as being shaped by modes of economic and social production and reproduction. Central to this perspective is a consideration of gender, and in particular how the capitalist mode of production creates and sustains an equal distribution of economic and social resources among men and women. It also draws our attention to class and race, and how local and global processes of racialization contribute to an equitable division of labor and opportunities, which makes this an intersectional theory as well. So in identifying, understanding, and making visible social relations of inequality, or what is also called relations of ruling, the aim of this analysis is to demonstrate how these relations are not natural or inevitable, but rather are socially determined, and thus ultimately transformable through struggle and resistance. So the central assumption of this perspective is that social change is possible as people collectively and individually make their own history, although not under conditions of their own choosing or simply the result of ideas that spring independently to their minds. So this perspective is very useful for examining unwanted sexual attention in the workplace because it allows us to consider how sexual norms in the workplace are mediated by social and historical forces and practices including state intervention, individuals' perceptions and values, and the reinforcement and resistance to state influence. It also enables us to question whose interests are currently represented within public policy on sexual harassment in the workplace by considering how these policies reflect tensions between workers, employers, and governmental interests with regard to the appropriate mechanism of prevention and definitions of acceptable levels of risk. As Dorothy Smith reminds us, official bureaucratic and administrative texts, including public policy or statistics about long-term care providers' outcomes or descriptions of their occupational hazards, are not objective forms of knowledge, but rather the pro product of knowledge considered from the standpoint of those who benefit from the current relations of ruling. So the task of feminist political economists, then, is to construct knowledge that reflects the actual daily social life and social relations between individuals, and then to consider how well official texts reflect their activities, interactions, responsibilities, constraints, and choices, or lack of them. And this type of research can serve as a guide or a blueprint for action that enables individuals to join with others in the struggle for enacting social change. So I began my study with a public policy analysis of documents related to workers, sorry, to healthcare providers' education and professional training, legislation governing their practice, and other forms of regulation pertinent to understanding providers' experiences of sexual attention in the context of long-term care. So on this slide, I have just a few examples of the sources where that, and the text that I've collected and analyzed. I collected all of these from publicly available online sources. So web pages of educational institutions for, for care providers, professional organizations, government websites. And then I analyzed the content of these texts by drawing on the premises of feminist political economy. So in my analysis, I examined what these texts said about sexuality and analyzed how they construct or give shape to the problem of unwanted sexual attention or sexual harassment, as well as to its potential solutions. So I identified several tensions, contradictions, and problematic assumptions about gender, power, and the caregiving dynamic. The first tension in public policy is the tension between the rights of the person doing the work, that is, care providers, and the rights of the persons receiving the care, in this case, residents. And there's three types of legislation that are most relevant when considering how to address sexual harassment or attention in a context of a long-term care workplace. 
So these are the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the Human Rights Code, and the Long-Term Care Homes Act. And so on the next slide are a few excerpts from this legislation that mention sexual harassment or abuse. It's a little bit of a busy slide, but I wanted to make sure that you have this information as I'm talking about it. So the Human Rights Code says that every person who occupies accommodation has a right to freedom from harassment. It also says that every person who is an employee has a right to freedom from harassment in the workplace by his or her employer or agent of the employer or another employee. The Occupational Health and Safety Act, as of September of this year, now has a section on workplace sexual harassment as well. And it defines this in two ways. So first, sexual harassment is defined as engaging in a course of vexatious comment or conduct against the workplace, uh, sorry, against the worker in a workplace, where the course of comment or conduct is known or ought reasonably to be known as unwelcome. So the second definition is a quid pro quo type of harassment. And this is making a sexual solicitation or advance where the person making the advance is in a position to confer, grant, or deny a benefit to the worker that's making the advance to. It also says that they would reasonably know that the, this advance or solicitation is unwelcome. Now, the Long-Term Care Homes Act also talks about abuse. So the fundamental principle of this act is that the long-term care home is primarily the home of the resident. And it states that every resident has a right to be protected from abuse. And abuse can mean sexual, emotional, verbal, financial, or physical. And in terms of the right to be protected, it says that the licensee of the long-term care home must protect residents from abuse by anyone and shall ensure that residents are not neglected by the licensee or staff. So just from these three excerpts, you can see already there's a tension between the individualist or person-centered focus of the Long-Term Care Homes Act and the more pluralist ethic that underpins the Human Rights Code or the Health and Safety Act. In fact, the only piece of legislation that recognizes long-term care as a specific context for abuse or harassment that requires its own mechanism of legal protection is based on the principle that this setting is first and primarily a home, not a workplace. And these different legislations result in an unequal form of protection afforded to care receivers as residents of the long-term care home as compared to providers who work in this setting. So for example, the Human Rights Code states that all workers have the right to freedom from harassment, while the Long-Term Care Home Act states that residents have a right to be protected from abuse. The distinction between these two statements is subtle, but it's powerful, as it's essentially the difference between having a negative or a positive right to be free from abuse. A negative right exists unless someone acts to negate it. A positive right is, however, the right to be subjected to a particular action from another person or group, and in this case, their protection. The difference between these two is that a positive right, unlike a negative right, explicitly obligates a particular action or duty on behalf of governments and employers. The only explicit rights that workers have under the Occupational Health and Safety Act are the rights to know about hazards, the right to participate in the process of identifying and resolving hazards and other health and safety concerns, and the right to refuse work that may cause physical injury. So for long-term care workers, the right to refuse is restricted to cases where the risk is not inherent to the worker's work or a normal condition of their employment, or when their refusal to work would directly endanger the life, health, or safety of another person. So you can see how this can become problematic in the context of sexual attention. So the Health and Safety Act does state that employers have a duty to workers, but the scope of their duty is restricted and qualified. So it explicitly states, for example, that employers must take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of the worker. And examples of what precaution, a reasonable precaution for protection would look like, it says that employers must provide information, instruction, and supervision to the worker to protect their health and safety. So their specific duty to protect them in cases of harassment focuses on the investigation of complaints and the development of a harassment prevention policy. 
But the Occupational Health and Safety Act also says that workers, healthcare providers in this case, have an obligation to themselves, uh, themselves have an obligation to support their own health and safety, as well as that of others. This in effect makes the responsibility for enabling health and safety a joint responsibility between workers, employers, and the government. Um, if anybody wants to know more about that and how that works in practice, I can talk later afterwards. So also note that the wording of the right to be free from sexual harassment in the Human Rights Code explicitly recognizes harassment only from employers, mm -hmm. agents of the employer, or other employees. No mention is made of others in the workplace, including care receivers or even visitors such as family members that may be in that space. The Health and Safety Act adopts an even more neutral stance towards the issue of context, but not explicitly naming any form of relationship between the harassment and complainant in the first type, and in the second type, only recognizing a quid pro quo harassment, which is a harassment based on the position to grant or deny advancement. So it shouldn't be a surprise that legally mandated training on sexual harassment in the workplace, developed based on these legislation, tends to focus almost exclusively on examples of classic or top-down forms of sexual harassment, that is, harassment perpetrated by a worker who is senior to the complainant, so for example, a manager towards a subordinate. I'm sure all of us in this room have experience with doing this kind of training and the kind of examples that are used. Um, so the second thing to note is that the Human Rights Code and the Occupational Health and Safety Act qualify the right to be free from sexual harassment under the principle of the, quote, reasonable person. So central to the legal concept of sexual harassment is not only that the conduct in, que in question is offensive to the complainant, in this case it would be a care provider, but it has to also be established that it's conduct that would be offensive to a reasonable person in a similar environment, and thus the harasser should know or, or ought to have known that their conduct would be unwelcome. No explanation is provided in, leg in the legislation of what is meant by reasonably known. This is interpreted by adjudicators when the case is brought forward, and it's interpreted often on an individual basis. Historically, if you read sexual harassment um, scholarship, how this standard has been interpreted suggests that it's not typically interpreted in the favor of women. Often definitions or decisions about what is sexually offensive are based on what men would find to be sexually offensive rather than what women would find to be sexually offensive. And adjudicators heavily rely on the standard in cases where the behavior is subtle or it does not involve overt physical injuries. Typically to qualify as harassment, the conduct has to happen on multiple occasions. Oops. And the harasser and to consider whether the harasser knew or should have known that their conduct would be unwelcome or offensive, adjudicators consider the complainant's behavior in the context of the specific workplace. So they ask questions, for example, did the worker participate in the conduct in question? Were they part of similar behavior in the past? They may also consider the overall atmosphere or the work culture of the environment and ask whether this type of conduct was normal to the workplace. So the application of the reasonable person standard is typically based on the notion of individual consent. And to establish that something is in fact sexual harassment, workers must prove that they clearly and consistently objected to the sexual conduct and that this is not an accepted or normal part of their type of work. Demonstrating this burden of proof may be difficult in the case of care providers who experience unwanted sexual attention from residents. Care work is an intimate and relational form of labor that involves direct handling and manipulation of other people's bodies, as well as the management of emotions to establish trust and make the person that you're caring for feel cared for. So to accomplish their work, providers must secure the participation or compliance of the care receiver through tactile and often intimate interactions, while at the same time engaging in ongoing efforts to desexualize their touch and professionalize their intimacy. Thus, whether a specific interaction is identified as offensive or as agreeable by the worker will depend not only on the intention of the care receiver, but also on workers' interpretation of the intent and the interchange between them.
Given that dementia is marked by a progressive deterioration in cognition that is, affects reasoning capacity, and that workers and managers routinely normalize residents' aggressive and provoking actions as unintentional but unavoidable aspects of care work, it's unlikely that providers will interpret unwanted sexual attention from residents as a form of discrimination that they're legally entitled to protection from. So contrast the language around protection from harassment or abuse in the Human Rights Code of the Occupational Health and Safety Act with the language of the Long-Term Care Homes Act that says that the licensee, that is whoever has the license to manage or operate the long-term care home, as well as healthcare providers in that space have a legal duty to protect residents from sexual abuse. This duty includes the obligation of implementing a policy of zero tolerance of abuse towards residents and the mandatory obligation to report cases of abuse or suspected cases of abuse. So putting aside the issue of how a zero tolerance policy can even be implemented in practice or the problematic assumption that abuse is a problem that is best addressed with criminal justice processes, it's clear that the bar is set much higher in relation to the duty to prevent sexual abuse or harassment against residents in a long-term care home. Unlike the Health and Safety Act or the Human Rights Code, the Long-Term Care Homes Act doesn't prescribe any duties to residents in relation to their conduct or to collectively supporting health and safety in the home. The lack of a mention of residents' duties with respect to prevention of abuse, as well as the legal obligation to protect them is underpinned by the normative assumption that residents are essentially and permanently vulnerable to abuse from others. While this is arguably necessary, given the widespread evidence of abuse against older people and persons with disabilities, an unintentional consequences of this assumption is it forecloses the consideration of how care receivers can be both vulnerable and aggressive. And this makes it difficult to imagine them as individuals who can be harassing or violence toward others and leaves us unequipped of how to for how to respond to such forms of aggression, including the development of sociocultural and organizational strategies to prevent or mitigate such conduct and practice. So my analysis suggests that the current legislation renders care providers' experiences of sexual harassment or attention from residents as both unrecognizable and irredeemable. So when it comes to professional and educational texts, um, my analysis suggests that long-term care providers may not have enough training and knowledge of how best to respond to unwanted sexual attention from residents. So although regulated care providers, so for example nurses, physiotherapists, social workers, have a lot more access to education than unregulated providers, such as personal care workers, all providers receive little overt instruction about how to respond to unwanted sexual attention in the context of care. Educational programs rarely include a mandatory course focused on sexuality, and when they do, the content of the course is typically on care providers' responsibility to support the sexual health and sexual needs of their clients, rather than around how to negotiate problematic or ambiguous sexual dynamics, or how to address unwanted sexual advances. Reviewing professional standards and practice guidelines shows that providers are simultaneously instructed to develop close and caring relationships with care receivers while also maintaining a professional distance. Further, the onus is placed on providers to ensure that they, as well as the care receiver, do not breach intimate or sexual boundaries. So like the Long-Term Care Health Act, such texts reflect the assumption that there's a fundamentally unequal power dynamic between care providers and care receivers that makes receivers essentially susceptible to sexual abuse from providers. So here's just one expert from the, Canadian, uh, from the College of Nurses of Ontario Therapeutic Client Nurse Relationship Practice Standard. So it says, at the core of nursing is a therapeutic nurse-client relationship. The nurse establishes and maintains this relationship by using knowledge and skills and applying caring attitudes and behavior. The nurse-client relationship is one of unequal power. Nurses are responsible for effectively establishing and maintaining the limits or boundaries in a therapeutic nurse-client relationship, including protecting the client from abuse. The nurse meets this standard by not engaging in behaviors with a client or making remarks that may be reasonably perceived by other nurses or others 
to be romantic, sexually suggestive, exploitative, or sexually abusive. So another example is from the Standards of, for the Prevention of Sexual Abuse for Occupational Therapists that states that occupational therapists are responsible for setting and managing boundaries to ensure that the trust the client has placed in them is not betrayed. When setting boundaries, occupational therapists must ensure that their words, actions, and interpersonal relationships are not misinterpreted by the client. So some professional organizations are even more explicit about professionals' duty to manage care receivers' sexual behavior as well as their own. Even if the patient or client initiates the behavior, the professional is ultimately responsible for managing any potential boundary crossing. So for example, take the following practice case example from the Physiotherapist Standard Guide to Therapeutic Relationships and Professional Boundaries that has a section on managing patient-initiated boundary crossings. So it says, Susan has been treating Jacob for two weeks. She provides him with support and encouragement by discussing his progress with him and reminding him of his achievement. During treatment, Jacob tells Susan that he's developing feelings for her. So in the discussion section, it says, Susan has a professional obligation to manage the therapeutic relationship and ensure that appropriate boundaries remain intact. She should objectively review her behavior over the previous two weeks and reflect on how she may have contributed to Jacob's misunderstanding. She'll have to recalibrate the boundaries and inform Jacob of what her responsibilities are in the therapeutic relationship. If she feels that she's unable to establish or maintain the relationship, she'll have to consider transferring Jacob's care to another physiotherapist. So you can see from the professional documents that care receiver sexual attention towards a provider is constructed as the failure of the provider in managing the care receiver. So such training suggests that when encountering unwanted sexual attention from a resident, professionals will likely blame themselves or worry that others will blame them rather than blame the care receiver. It's thus doubtful that care providers would or could identify boundary breaches as forms of sexual harassment or unwanted sexual attention as attributing the blame for the behavior onto the care receiver is tantamount to an admission of professional incompetency. One exemption to this is nursing that have a practice guideline on workplace violence that mentions uh, patients as potential perpetrators of violence. However, given the similar emphasis in nursing professional education on their responsibility for managing sexual boundaries, I'm not sure how effective this guideline is in practice. So, in the second phase of my research, I'm exploring how care providers manage sexual attention in practice by conducting observations and in-depth interviews at my study site. And currently, I'm in the midst of participant recruitment, but I wanted to share with you some challenges that I've had in designing and implementing this type of research in this particular phase to show you how these reflect similar tensions and assumptions regarding collective obligations to protect providers and care receivers. And if you're thinking of doing similar research, this may also be helpful to you for, for considering some things that I did not know when I started out. So I anticipated when I started out that I would have some ethical and practical challenges based on what I already knew about organizational research and about talking to people about sexuality and gender. What I didn't anticipate was how challenging it would be just to get ethics approval to do this study. My first obstacle was thinking through the potential impact that my research could have on providers' daily life and mental health. By wanting to do a multi-method ethnography, I could be interfering in their life in a substantial way. So as a first step, I looked at consent forms that others have used for this type of research and guidance on ethnographic ethics. These weren't very helpful. As most studies of sexual harassment, sexual attention in the workplace use retrospective surveys, which assume that participant risks are minimal as these are anonymous and less intensive forms of research. It wasn't really helpful in trying to figure out how to create my own consent form in this case. So I brought this to my supervisor, Pia Contos, who shared examples of consent forms and protocols that she had used for ethnographic studies that explore care relationships and interactions in long-term care. She also raised two issues for me to consider that I hadn't yet thought about. What do I think would be the impact of my research on care providers and my responsibility as a result 
if in, in recounting their experiences to me, they would come to realize that a past experience of theirs was in fact sexual harassment. And what would be the potential impact on the resident if this situation involved a current resident that they care for? I didn't really know how to answer the latter issue, but I thought that I could satisfy the former by providing workers with an educational pamphlet about their rights around sexual harassment in the workplace and local resources for where they could access support. She also suggested that I do the following. Book an ethics consultation with the Research Ethics Board to ask them what would be any potential concerns that I should address when creating my protocol, and also connect with the administrator contact of my site to let them know about the study and ask them what they think will be challenges or concerns and how I could address those. So I first met with my admin contact. Although I was worried that she would be resistant to my research and to me coming into that workplace, she was very receptive and noted that my research was very much needed as this was an ongoing issue at the study site that she's had experience with. She also offered to help with recruitment and mentioned that she could easily come up with a list of workers who had an experience with a resident or residents who had this documented in their chart. This was really wonderful in bolstering my confidence that I could do this and also allaying my fears of how I would actually get access to participants. What I didn't anticipate that the process of ethics review would take six months and three rounds of revision. And by the time I had approval to begin, my contact at the study site would leave the organization for another position. Oh. Yeah. Painful. <laughs> yeah. I understand it's not normal for postdoctoral research to take six months for ethics approval. My thesis research for my PhD took less than three months and, one, and really one round of revisions. So this is unusual, and I have a feeling that it's because of the nature of the research that I'm doing. So when I met with a bioethicist, I had a different experience. Although she was open to the idea of exploring sexual expression in long-term care, and shared some experiences of advising on ethical issues in this regard, she expressed concern that my desire to explore resident to provide a sexual expression um, and whether this was feasible, because she had not consulted on any cases of this. So she didn't think that I would be able to do this kind of research. She didn't think that I had a responsibility to protect providers, other than providing them with information about the potential for distress in the consent forms. Instead, she seemed more worried about what my observations of providers' reactions to sexual attention or their recounting of this, and noted that I would be legally responsible to report any cases of elder abuse or neglect. She suggested that I form an independent advisory committee so at least two people who didn't work at my study site and had expertise in the clinical population and the nature of the care provided who could help me with, the step, with reporting this. So this was a very strange experience for me because up until then I didn't even consider that there was a potential for observing abuse or for hearing about it. And this is, reflecting on this, this is likely because I was still focused on the distress of care providers that it was hard for me to envision that they could also cause distress. In retrospect, given what I now know about the legislation and what I've shown you, as well as how long-term care is funded, it shouldn't have been surprising to me that institutional priorities are focused on residents rather than providers. I was successful in convening a committee, and I found two individuals with professional expertise in both dementia and sexuality. So the experience of collaboratively developing with them the section outlining potential risks for my consent form was a really useful exercise for experiencing firsthand the difficulties that providers must have when interpreting legislative requirements and guidelines. Although I hoped that the advisory committee could simply tell me what the parameters around abuse were, or what clinical guidelines stated about what providers can and cannot do if a resident is sexual towards them, I quickly learned that there's no explicit rules instructing workers on how to respond to those situations. What does exist is a legal obligation to protect all forms of abuse and some general best practice guidelines of how providers should best respond when residents are socially destructive or combative or exhibit what is called responsive behaviors. The exact definition of what counts as a responsive behavior is unclear and subjective, but it can include a person being sexual towards a provider. So one of my committee members brilliantly suggested that we take the best practice guidelines and then we reverse them 
so that we can establish what constitutes a bad or inappropriate response on the provider side. We also decided that I would report any observed responses or accounts that match these parameters to the advisory committee, who could then determine whether it was of use and thus needed to be reported. So here's just an excerpt from my consent form. I thought it was helpful to share it because I had never seen it, anything on the consent form that looks like this. So it basically says that because the study is examining interactions that may be ambiguous until they're discussed with another person, there's a small chance that in the course of the study, there may be a risk of resident abuse or neglect. And that if that information is shared with me, I would have to, I was legally obligated to report this to people not involved in the study, the advisory committee, who would then determine whether it was in fact abuse or neglect, and I need to report this. Although I understand that the statement is necessary, both for recruiting participants and satisfying legislative requirements, I worry that this may suggest to workers that I'm privileging the rights of residents and may dissuade participation or undermine the quality of my data if workers restrict their comment or action for fear of being seen as abusive. My worry was further exacerbated when my research underwent a clinical impact review. And again, they asked me about how my study could negatively harm the residents. So for example, um, I was asked about what happens if in the course of the interview, my, my worker, so my participants would come to see what happened as sexual attention and what the ramifications of that would be on the resident caregiver relationship. So this process, the, developing the ethics pro, uh, protocol and designing my study and the public policy analysis that I've done so far has made me very aware of the vulnerability the care providers have working in long-term care, and the need to ensure that I'm sensitive to this vulnerability in future data collection and analysis. By observing providers and asking them how and why they respond to sexual attention in the ways that they do, I hope to gain a better understanding of how their responses are informed by social relations, regulatory models, and broader norms. Long-term care homes are liminal and complex spaces where the divide between public and private spheres of social life becomes blurred and yet current public policy appears to be insensitive to this complexity, which raises theoretical and practical questions of how to address sexual expression in ways that are both inclusive and ethical. My hope is that my research will provide insight into how individuals, organizations, and governments can collectively support both providers and care receivers sexual rights and their overall well-being. Thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. So much that was interesting. There's all kinds of issues I've never even really thought about. Mm -hmm. there, we have a small token of our appreciation Thank you for you to come. And I realize people will probably need to go in five minutes, but could we just take a few questions? Are you available? Oh, yeah, I'm totally available. Okay, any comments, questions? I've got a few, but I don't have to go really fast, so I, I'm happy to let someone who has to go really fast ask first. So if you have to go, yeah. you can go ahead. No, I mean, I got lots of time, I'm saying, so if someone needs to go, they can go first. I don't need to go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so just sometimes when people are coming in, it's a little oh, bit in from it. the hospital, yeah. so they've got to run back. Oh. But if nobody's in a rush, I guess the floor is yours. Go okay. for it. First off, thank you. Do you uh, want to just you introduce want? yourself yeah, too? I, I'm Scott Kearns. I, I'm a social work. I'm, I'm responsible for social work, teaching of ethics, supporting counseling for staff and residents in a long-term care home, a 200-bed home in Whitby. Mm -hmm. um, and the Don Valley was very crowded on it. I apologize for watching you late. I appreciate I, you coming. I feel r really fortunate to be working in a home that is very transparent about all the issues you mentioned. And that, mm -hmm. that kind of feels nice, and I write, because that's not always the case. Second of all, just your, your theoretical background. I really appreciate the materialistic, the, um, even the Marxist, the, the, all those levels of context that mm -hmm. these happen in, and I appreciate that a lot. It's going to be rich, rich stuff coming out, and a lot that informs that from different disciplines and all sorts of. Uh, my just a couple of concerns, just to throw your way in your thinking. Um, I, I'm responsible for teaching staff for it's called training education, but it's not just training. It's educating. Um, about how to respond to residents' behavior of any sort, aggressive, aggressive or sexual abuse, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and so I think we do a fairly good job with that, about boundaries and that. 
I totally see what you're saying about the legis the gap between, uh, say, official documents that would cover these areas and the lived experience. And that's always a gap really, really worth looking at. Uh, my, my concern is when, when you um, when you put the two, the, it was the nursing and the occupational therapist up there, mm -hmm. the, the reading that that has, bl I think the word was blamed the caregiver. I would just caution it. it the caregiver is responsible. Everything that they said there, they're responsible for. They're responsible. The resident says, I'm developing feelings, which is a very courteous resident. I've heard lots of different than I'm having feelings for you. Mm -hmm. so, so that was a fairly mild uh, res response there. But, but even so, if, even if they said, I'm, I've just reached out and touched you, or I, whatever, mm -hmm. the responsibility is the caregiver for now managing it. It doesn't mean I don't read that as blaming the caregiver for having done something wrong. Even the sentence that said, you should look, reflect on your practice, which is always the right thing to do. Did I do something wrong? Then that's bad. Did I do something that could be interpreted a couple of ways? That's something I need to learn about. But the responsibility does still stay on the, care, on the, on the professional. And I, I just, just I was a little uncomfortable with the, word, the reading of it that it blamed, because I don't mm -hmm. think it did. Now that leads to my second one. Am I still okay for time? Mm -hmm. My second thing is the, the, the statement, and I can't remember where. This is available later in written form, isn't it? Mm -hmm. good, so I forget everything. But the, the, the harasser has to know that it would be unwelcome. So what I didn't hear a lot of here was the enormous number of cognitively impaired residents mm -hmm. that, I mean, statistically now it's getting the, its rarity to actually admit someone that's brilliantly clear and simply physically challenged. They, it happens, but mm -hmm. so so the responsibility that our society holds cognitively impaired, and then there's all the levels of cognitive impairment. If you just have memory problems, you forget that you've mm -hmm. propositioned that stack member five, five times already in the day, right? But also the other is disoriented, I don't know who that is, all, all that kind of, and that, the mixture of all that is really complex. And, and I didn't hear it in there about, mm -hmm. because if we're saying, how are we treating it as harassment? Mm -hmm. And the harasser has to know mm -hmm. what they're doing. That's a pretty tricky assessment mm -hmm. of the resident to determine. And I, we work, I, I, I developed the policy in our division for sexual uh, resident sexual and intimate behavior. And it's just been trounced around by the ministry and back forth and back forth. <laughs> I think we got it right now. But it, it's, it has to take into account the, the, the cognitive impairment because responsibility for it. So then I'm wondering how you would see to balance it better mm -hmm. because what would be the ideal thing? So a resident with cognitive impairment has propositioned a staff member, call it harassment, you're going to have to hold them responsible and therefore you would do what mm -hmm. to the resident? So what would be that, if you're going to say there's responsibility on both sides, that's a tricky area to hold a cognitively impaired resident responsible. Is it a wrong thing? Yes, absolutely. Does it upset the staff member? I deal with that all the time. Yes, of course it does. And it's wrong and it's bad and it's awful. But where is the where is the responsibility? Not that they're responsible for it, but they're responsible for handling themselves and others in it. Mm -hmm. Is the distinction clear? It's, it's a bit murky yeah. there. We just come out of a lot of murkiness. So um, in the wording. So that's what I, I would just, I'm anxious to see how the responsibility is laid out and what that would look like. Because I've met with many residents, you know, you know it's not okay that you touch the care guy and did that, and then they do it the next day and do it. So it's what to do with that. The other part, the last part is the, 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 um, the residents' responsibilities. They used to have it in long-term care, residents' responsibilities. And they've taken it completely away, mm -hmm. off the wall, they took it off the wall. But then what would you replace it with? The resident's responsible for behaving in a certain way, and then how do you hold a cognitively impaired? And I'm purely talking cognitively impaired residents here, mm -hmm. not talking about the other. So those are just the complexities I see popping out all over the place in that, and, and I'd really like to, to see the results of that, and I totally understand why you're having all the mess with the ethics, because you're going into one of the most personal, emotional issues, and. Mm -hmm the potential for you actually to be telling a staff member, yes, you were harassed, changes their life a bit there too, so that's mm -hmm. big. You know. So those are just thoughts I have there. Thank you. Um, yeah, I agree with you that it's very, very complex.
my interest in talking about the legislation is to show how there is a gap between the current legislation versus what actually happens in long-term care. So the particular context of long-term care is not really well recognized around the rules of what is sexual harassment or what are workers' rights in regard to that. My hope is that workers will be the ones who will have a better idea of what kind of support they need and what would help them. Um, and my intent in showing you the legislation of public policy is to show you how much the legislation that exists influence the kind of supports or practice guidelines that are developed and how even the practice guidelines are insensitive to the particular context of long-term care. They do assume that the caregiver is caring for somebody who is someone, like as you say, would say something and be able to understand the response and could be in some way held accountable. So it's, I agree with you, it's much more complex in the context of long-term care. Um, but I do think that we need to do more to support care providers so that they can provide the best care that they possibly can. And my hope that this shifts us towards thinking how we can support providers while also supporting the residents because they're all sharing the same space. And they have to share that space for a very long time. And perhaps that there's things we can do at the organizational level and how the care work is organized and how much autonomy workers have around how, who they care for and what happens, and that that would help, mm -hmm. rather than the individual worker and the individual resident. The, the, the exposure in long-term care to people's personal behavior lives is so unlike any other workplace mm -hmm. in the world, where we lock into to personal things. I, I help trying to help staff who seen two residents having sexual issues and it upset the staff for day. Like it's mm -hmm. not even to them, but it, they're mm -hmm. exposed to it. They see and experience things that they would never, in, if you worked at McDonald's or IBM or something, you'd never even see mm -hmm. it or think about it, and all of a sudden you're in it. So lots of support is really, really helpful. Yeah. yeah. I hope to tease those things out too, because I do think there's a much, there's a different kind of expectation that should be for providers when seeing sexuality between residents versus sexuality is directed towards them specifically. I think our guidelines of how what we should do in the context of residents being sexual with each other should be very different right. from the guidelines of what providers should do if a resident is sexual towards them explicitly. And I think current guidelines that expect that providers recalibrate those boundaries by telling something different to care receivers and telling them the scope of their practice may not be so useful if, as you say, that person would not remember what they did or would not be able to comprehend it. So we need something different, and I'm hoping that workers can tell me what that something different could look like. Thank you. I also found it very fascinating, and, and I had some of the same thoughts or thoughts along the same lines. My name is Angela Moore. I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I my work for uh, until recently was in healthcare regulation for a number mm -hmm. of years. So I was looking at the, the policies and guidelines that you showed and thinking about them from the perspective of developing policies mm -hmm. and guidelines mm -hmm. like that. And um, the role of the regulatory colleges is, is to protect the public, not the registrants. Mm -hmm. So those regulations are going to definitely be written from that perspective. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to see what policies and guidelines from the associations who represent the practitioners said, whether the focus might be somewhat different. I don't know if you take a look at that. Yes. So for example, I have the Ontario Nurses Association and they have some resources around that. But they're very fairly limited in the sense of telling workers what they could do within the legal parameters and guidelines that currently exist. So they're subject to the same regulations. Yeah. And I realize too that there's other pieces of legislation that I didn't talk about that inform how this is tackled. Um, so for example, the Regulated Professions Act explicitly talks around, about sexual abuse towards um, towards clients, which is why the regulatory colleges have such an um, emphasis around guidelines with respect to that. Um, but I think it's really interesting what happens when we have these general guidelines for workers around sexual harassment or attention, and in the specific case of healthcare workers, and that don't meet. Like, the two, the, the two separate pieces of legislation don't really meet, but both are relevant to considering the case of providers. And all of the focus on the resident seems to leave the provider behind. Mm 
it's it's very true. You've identified a, a, a significant gap, and a significant gap that's compounded by dealing with sexuality, which mm -hmm. I'd say the vast majority of people are really uncomfortable with yeah. to begin with in their own lives, let alone dealing with it yeah. in in a broader perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I'm really looking forward to to your the solutions that you're looking for. Thank yeah. you. I really do think that at the level of education, there's a lot that we mm. could do, even if telling providers that this is something that could happen to them. Yes. Both the individuals that I talked to so far, I've only talked to two, have said that this is something they never even thought about prior to actually working in front front work. And it seems very strange to me that, that they haven't, in some sense, considered that, that could happen. Yes. Even with all the professional education that they have around sexual yeah. boundaries. We, we include it in our orientation. Yes, so staff our, mentioned that the workplace yeah, is where this comes up. The, what you might meet on your average day, mm -hmm. how to mm -hmm. interpret it, and then when to report it, how to, where to get some help. Mm -hmm. And the reporting system, too, like that's a very, it's one way to deal with what is happening, but I think there could be other ways to deal with it that don't individualize it. So it becomes the problem of that yeah. resident and that worker right. who came forward. And then you're dealing with. Oh, no, no, no. This is particularly so because some of them don't come forward. So yes. You're missing that. Yes. Yes. And you're dealing with regulated health care professionals. And I just think about what personal support workers who are going by themselves out into individual homes mm -hmm. where there's no one there yeah. to protect them or for them to turn to. Yeah. I think it's it's the tip of the, of the iceberg. Well, long-term care home is this very strange place where you have regulated, unregulated, private, yeah. uh, public workers, and they all work together, yes. technically in the same space, but they all are subject to different regulations and to different organizing bodies, yeah. right? Personal support workers are particularly vulnerable, because yes. they do the majority of the personal care, exactly. and yet they have no one to turn to, because yeah. they don't have a professional body. Mm -hmm. no. Do you know how soon that's co it is coming, the regulation is here? I hope so, but I'm not sure yeah. what it would look like. Mm -hmm. I mean, they already have a set of standards, and the standards that they have look very similar to the standards for regulated professions in the sense that they talk about their responsibility to establish a very close relationship and also maintain the boundaries. So I worry that the curriculum would, would, um, would look very similar to the existing curriculum, and I think that all of it could use more education around boundaries. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to second that point about the education. I think that's a very important piece of work, and we're seeing this also in another report we're doing for the Public Health Agency of Canada right now. They especially those education problems are actually really managed, and I hope that your study really will fill one of those educational gaps. Um, just as a other research associate, I just wanted to second one of the points you're making in terms of contacting the IV prior. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's a really good idea in having these mm -hmm. conversations. Um, we are also running in one of our studies into one of those issues, and this is the issue of duty to report. Mm -hmm. And it is very tricky to actually mandate that. And, and just in terms of what was suggested to us in terms of language is that they are saying to us that we need to guarantee anonymity, which is the other thing that is out there. Mm -hmm. But it also has this clause now that it says until obligated otherwise by law. Mm -hmm. and I think this, this is the other thing that a lot of those protocols now yeah. enclose, and we're not quite sure how to actually deal with this. Yeah. And the other thing is, if there is something that we observe might be across the line, the actual question also becomes, which supports do you need to make available? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the other thing that's quite unclear at this point in yeah. time, and we're struggling with exactly the same thing. Yeah. It didn't surprise me that you had three rounds. I uh, See, I work a lot also with children, mm -hmm. and vulnerable children with respect to mandated reporting and talking to parents, or do work on grandparents who are raising grandchildren. There's always a back and forth on that front because of the vulnerability of the sector in particular. So um, it, it didn't surprise me that this yeah. we talked around. I mean, I do find it ironic that if I was doing this with people in their private homes, nobody would care about my duty to report. The duty to report only exists because the legislation obligates you to report, and that's what makes it relevant. Um, and I do find it strange that the duty to report, or the duty, <coughs> sorry, to even think about my obligations, is again focused on my obligation to that resident. And while realizing that they're extremely vulnerable in lots of ways, I think the worker is also very vulnerable if I'm doing research in the workplace. And their worry around, um, around how their behavior or actions will be interpreted 
is really something to think about. And of course, there's regional variations from in some states where there's mandatory reporting of because of dog protective services. Mm -hmm. That would be the norm, whether you're in a community environment or if you're in a long-term care mm -hmm. issue. So, in some ways, we're not representative in Ontario of what's going on in the longer scheme. Yeah. 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 It is interesting that you're bringing the, the issue of children to the idea that both children and older adults are. Um, there's a particular understanding of what they look like and what their vulnerability lies in. Like, what are the reasons for their vulnerability? Then changes how we think towards how to protect them. I, and I think it's not older adults. In, I mean, in the U.S., there's a little bit more, but in here it's not older adults in general, but the fact that 95% have dementia and are therefore mm -hmm. um, quite vulnerable on that front. One more thought. To the macro level of the, the legislation and the micro, I was just thinking of that mental in the middle there, mm -hmm. because you know, I've talked to so many fellow social workers where even if the legislation, legislation was perfect, and they wanted to do a good job here, that level of the administration at various levels, like I work for the, because it's a regional home, so there's layers and layers of government on top, which in some ways is really great, and in some ways is really slow. So the interpretation of it at all those levels, mm -hmm. you, you can sit there with a you know, very, very balanced wording there, but you know, it's education of even non-nursing, non-caregiving people that manage them. Mm -hmm. and how to support and how to yeah. interpret even the words and, and that, that's huge. Yeah, and I am looking at that. I'm interviewing administrators who work at the site to get a sense of how they manage that in practice and I am looking at organizational documents for that home um, but that's part of in the pr process of recruitment right. because those right. are private right. which is another challenge this idea that this is a public organization and yet my access to their documents is right. Uh, right. curtailed in some right. sense. But I have looked, for example, like I work for a hospital, um, in the context of a hospital, so I look at our policies. Those policies are fairly reflective of the kind of assumptions and things that I've talked about. Like those policies developed in relationship to what the legislation said mm -hmm. you should cover, like the minimum around that usually. Right. So they're very similar. Yeah. But I'm looking forward to see what it really looks like right. at the mm -hmm. MISA level and of the home. The interpretation of a local policy. Yes. Or application maybe is another word, application. Yeah. I, I've actually seen a, a nursing manager put an allegation of abuse under her blotter and say, "This is what I do on Fridays." So, it, so it's the it's the behavior at those levels that can really make a caregiver's life so vulnerable because to, mm -hmm. to, they're looking up there, and say, "Oh, that protects me." But yeah. You know, so. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Well, thank you again. It was wonderful.